You're listening to the Bird Dog Babe Podcast with my mom, Courtney Bastion. So when everybody asks me, hey, what, what, what shells do you shoot? Or if I ask them, what shells do you shoot? And they give me a brand. I say, okay, that tells me nothing. That's mm-hmm. like saying, oh, you know, those blue shoes. I'm like, okay, well, they're blue. Like that could be anything. Um, so I figured out the specs that I like. For sporting plays. So if it's a two and three quarter uh, dram shell with um, 1200 feet per second and it's let's say seven and a half shot um, for sporting clays or eights. Um, that's what I look for. And then I because sometimes if I'm going to look for shells I can't find the brand that I want with that spec. So if I can find that spec with another brand I'm going to be pretty happy with how it feels and the confidence that it gives me that that's the shell that I'm comfortable with. Hey bird dog babes, my name is Courtney Bastion and I am obsessed with all things bird dogs. And I'm here with you to share the stories, experiences, knowledge, and opinions from the women and a few guys in the industry that are killing it. I'm a Wisconsin girl living in a Montana world. I'm mom and two incredible kiddos, wife and occasional assistant to a pro gun dog trainer, traveling the U.S. talking about canine nutrition while hunting, breeding, and competing with my German wire hair pointers and Bracco Italianos. As someone who started hunting later in life because I wanted to give my dogs the opportunity to do what they were bred to do, I'm here to help inspire, educate, and connect women to get their bird dogs out in the field and experience a bond like no other. So pour yourself a glass of wine and get ready to be challenged and encouraged while you learn. This is the Bird Dog Babe Podcast. Welcome to my two newest Patreon patrons of the Bird Dog Babe podcast, Kelly Schur and Maria Jacenko. Another patron, Randy O'Neill, took advantage of the awesome Garmin discount I'm able to offer my patrons and has a gorgeous Phoenix watch coming her way this week. These Garmin watches are like a Fitbit on crack, and you're able to pair it with your Alpha or Pro 550 Plus unit and track your dogs from your watch which means you can leave the handheld in your vest and know where your dogs are and keep both hands on your gun. And I'm all about having better odds out there. Anyhow, I'm extremely grateful for the support of my Patreon patrons pitching in $5 per month and not only able to find value in this podcast, but also able to get some extra perks I'm able to give them. So you guys rock. Thank you. I'm pretty stoked about our Pheasants Forever Women Wine and Wild Game event this weekend at Excel Shooting Sports in Kalispell, Montana. Ladies will have the opportunity to hunt over some of our Big Sky Chapters NAVDA dogs, get proper gun fit, and demo the Siren Shotgun line, as well as enjoy an amazing feast of game bird and big game recipes while enjoying some wine. It's awesome that we have organizations like Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever that help support and put on these events. If you hunt or are planning to hunt this year, do me a favor and become a member and or donate to the organization that is working hard for the conservation of that species. These organizations are having some hurt put on them this year without the ability to hold banquets and pint nights. Those dollars have gone towards habitat improvement, public awareness, education, and land management programs. And if you're hunting public land, join the backcountry hunters and anglers. They advocate for hunting heritage and the ability for all of us to enjoy public land and waters. And if we want our kids and their kids to have those same opportunities, we need to support these organizations. My guest today is Lynn Green, the brand manager for Siren Shotguns. She came out to Montana a few weeks ago and helped at our women's shooting clinic. I learned a ton and found myself picking Lynn's brain about random gun questions including chokes, ammo, and gun cleaning and storage. So I wanted to have her on and get deeper into that conversation because truth be told, my husband has always changed up the chokes for me and I never understood which one should be used for what. And if you've ever walked into an aisle at a sporting goods store to buy some ammo, you know how overwhelming it can be. So let's get after it. Thank you to sponsor Dakota 283, unparalleled protection for traveling to and from your favorite hunting spot. 
Dakota 283 kennels are a premium quality roto mold with recess handles on top for convenient and safe tie down and makes it easy to lift up into the truck. I love the secure door frame with high security locks so I know my dogs are safe when I need to stop for fuel. An added bonus is the drain hole in the back which makes cleaning a breeze when your dog has been run hard and put away wet. Head over to Dakota283.com and use promo code Bird Dog Babe for a 10% discount. Thanks to sponsor Excel Shooting Sports, elite dealer of Caesar Guarini, Fab Arm, and Siren Shotguns. Siren is the world's only full line of shotguns created for the female competitor, hunter, and shotgun enthusiast. Excel is one of only four demo centers west of the Mississippi. They give you the opportunity to actually try out a gun before you walk out the door with it. As an elite dealer for Caesar Guarini, Excel offers their customers unlimited pit stops of free service and tune-ups on all shotguns, a great way to have your gun in top condition for the upcoming hunting or target season. In addition, they're offering an exclusive deal to all of the Bird Dog Babe listeners for a free gun slip with each purchase, a $90 value. All right. Good morning, Lynn, and welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Courtney. I'm excited to have you on here today. Um, met you a couple weeks ago at the Women's Shooting Clinic at Excel Shooting Sports in Kalispell, and that was an amazing weekend. Yes, I had a great time. Yeah, you taught. What, how many did we have there total? We had 35? Yeah. The f- no, just two- over 40 over the two days. Okay. It was an awesome learning opportunity, and it was from that and what uh, you, you and a couple other people there went over that weekend with the ammo talk and the different gauges and chokes, um, and the reason why I wanted to have you on today because I know those ladies there got a lot of value from that conversation because buying ammo can be extremely overwhelming, yes. so um, you shed an amazing light on that, and I wanted our listeners to be able to get that information as well. So I appreciate you being here. Well, we can make it as complicated or as simple as you want. <laughs> oh, it, it was just, <laughs> and everything in the middle. Yeah. Hopefully it's simple. We'll and keep it and simple. Yes. yeah, you know, and I was just saying the other day, I'm hoping I can figure out some kind of mnemonic for this, like kiss, keep it simple, stupid to, right. to be able to know the ammo gauges and chokes, some kind of mnemonic that can just make it so, so much easier to understand all of the technology and words here. (laughs) Tell me a little bit about your history in shotguns and how you came into your position as the Siren brand manager. Okay. Well, I was lucky that my dad had grown up hunting and when we were probably 12 or 13, he started duck hunting again and not having any brothers he offered us to go with him <laughs> out in the in, in the marsh um and so we did some i mean all four of us i have three sisters all four of us went at one point or the other i probably went more than some of my sisters did um but that's kind of how it all started and then over the years um in my late 20s i was working in advertising and i was talking to a girl at work one day and she said that she joined a skeet league And I said, wow, I, I'd love to do that. So started doing skeet league back in 99. And then that same club opened up, uh, had a new, new management and they added in a five stand and a couple sporting clays courses. And through there, I met a lot of women and one lady in particular, Cheryl, um, who was starting doing sporting clays. And so in, in 2004, we started going all around Texas and shooting sporting clays every weekend. Uh, I was totally addicted. I shot over awesome. 5,000 registered targets my first year. <laughs> it was insane. Wow. wow. We had so much fun though. We had a, such a good time. And um, that just led to, you know, just traveling around, going to the, some of the bigger shoots um, in 2009, when there were no jobs, I started taking pictures because I had a camera and I enjoyed it. Pictures of people shooting sporting clays. And that was how I met um, a lot of the industry people, including um, the management at Cesar Garini. 
And so I did a couple other things. I was working my technology job and um, in 2015, in January, 2015, they asked me to be on the pro staff and I'm not by any means the best shooter, but I can pretty much talk to anybody <laughs> and I love guns. I'm very passionate about it. And so um, I got on the pro staff. Uh, my gun actually didn't come until that fall, but then um, the position opened up for the siren brand manager. And so I joined um, in April, sorry, May of 2016. I joined okay. the company officially and then uh, moved up to Maryland in April of 17. So just over four years at Siren, and I've learned a lot too. What I thought I knew about guns before was not really a whole lot compared to what I've learned in the last four years. So it's it's been a really great opportunity. Right. And you've mentioned, um, you know, right there at your office, the shop is right behind you. So when you have questions and when you're looking for uh, cleaning supply recommendations, everything is right there for you. So that's got to okay. be a wealth of knowledge just in itself. Oh yeah. Anytime there's a question, I want to be more educated or somebody calls and asks a question. Yes. Being able to walk back and ask the gunsmiths who work on these guns every day, um, what they use, you know, it's, it's invaluable because there's a lot of different products out there to use. And you can pick and choose that, you know, there's a lot of things that are pretty much the same, but I figure if these guys are using what, what they are, then it's probably good enough for me too. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And something I noticed at the shooting clinic that I really appreciated was how much time you took um, with each woman individually with the gun fitting portion of it. You were doing the wingspan measurements and walking them through the perfect fit for them. And I can just see the passion that was rolling off of you and the, and how much you wanted to be able to help them just get comfortable with, with shooting a shotgun. Cause I think so many times we just pick up one and go, yeah, that feels good. Okay. I'll go shoot it. And you're like really focused on the right fit for them. Well, I think, it is intimidating to put a big long shotgun in your hands. And um, the other thing along with wingspan that I believe makes a huge difference is the eye dominance. And so many people have never needed to know their eye dominance or it doesn't really matter in their everyday life. But if you're going to shoot shotgun, it really does have an impact. And if, you know, if we lined up every single girl that was there, every single one of us was shaped differently. I mean, between arms and torsos and legs and obviously our bus size, um, you know, so getting something that they can feel comfortable in and then have good success at, well, that's, I mean, we can have fun shooting, but it's a whole lot more fun when you hit the targets. Yeah, absolutely. And the nice thing about the siren line too, is there's a gun for everyone. So if you want to do the sporting clays or skeet, trap, hunting from Upland and the waterfall option is, is Siren has it. Yeah. That's been one of the best things is that we really do have the full line. Nobody else can say that. And there are some other companies that have some really nice guns for ladies. I'm not going to knock that, but they usually only mm -hmm. have one, maybe two, but I can really offer you pretty much everything you want to do when it comes to a shotgun. So I like having that option a lot. Mm -hmm. And you do, you hunt yourself as well, don't you? I do um, obviously started with the duck hunting and I will not turn down duck or goose hunting, but I, over the years, I realized that probably my favorite is upland game. So mm -hmm. it's doves, quail, pheasants, um, walking and talking and moving around um, or just, you know, sitting there under a tree waiting for the doves to fly by. Um, that's probably, and then that ties in with my sporting clays, obviously, but um that's probably where if I, if I had to pick one, that's what I would pick to do right. all the time. And you had said, was it a hunt that you went on where um, the ladies were focused on training the dogs and they asked you to be the gunner for them? Yes, that was a, a pretty wildlife <laughs> in Mississippi. It was best day ever. <laughs> like, just come and shoot birds so we can have the dogs work. And yeah, anytime <laughs> anybody wants to call me and help with that, I'm more than happy to. <laughs> that's awesome. Um, so let's, let's get into, uh, the topic of chokes first. So you buy a gun and you get 
uh, chokes that come with it. So is it typically about what, five or six? We uh, have five for our field guns and six for the sporting guns. Yes. Okay. So what is, which chokes are included there? So on the sporting model, you get uh, a cylinder, skeet, two improved cylinder, light mod, mod, and full, I think, or the, what the thing, or what we provide for the sporting guns. Um, and you can switch those out. So if you were, you know, if you wanted to have two skeets or two fulls or whatever, um, we give you the option to say, just let us know which ones you want to switch out and we will put whatever six chokes you want. Oh, okay. Yeah. So that's okay. kind of nice. Same with the field guns. Um, and we, on the field models, we have extended chokes and we have flush chokes. A lot of times in the field, um, having extended chokes will get grass cut, you know, stuck in between them or something like that. So that's why they're usually flush with the end of the barrel. Okay. Sporting, I mean, sporting guns are extended so that the people that are particular about changing their chokes every station can just do them by their fingers. Just Oh, screw them they're out. changing them every station? Some people do. Some what would be the do. purpose of that? Well, in sporting clays, you've got different presentations for each station. Mm -hmm. So if you go from one station that was two long 40 or 50 yard crossers to a close in station that's got a, an incoming target and a rabbit, um, you might want to change your chokes for those because you've got the distance and then you've got close up. And, you know, now when I first started, I will admit I was one of those choke changers. <laughs> I did it quite a bit, but mm -hmm. then I realized that I, it, it gets in your head. Um, you know, what choke should I need? And then you're worrying about that. Whereas I, as I got more experience as a sporting clay shooter, I just stuck a couple of light mods in and just left them there because then it wasn't, I just re reduced my variables for what was could get in my head and what I was worried about. Okay. So for the upland and waterfall hunter, what are going to be the important and necessary chokes to have? So the, um, on waterfowl, we'll start with that one. So if you do have to shoot steel, um, we actually do, you can shoot them through our barrels because they are chrome lined, but they do recommend a more open choke for okay. steel. I mean, for, yeah, for steel. So, um, so you're going to have, I mean, up to an, an improved cylinder, um, probably for, um, up and game, maybe a little bit tighter, depending on the birds that you're shooting, if they're going to be close in or far off. I mean, because, um, you just, that pattern you want to get to the bird, obviously. And if they're going to be way up close and, and within kind of like a skeet range, of a, of a, like, I mean, that's kind of how I relate to my targets or a trap or skeet and trap range of a target, um, versus something that's going to be, um, a little bit further out. Maybe if you're out in like West Texas and the quail are running and flying a whole lot further and faster, then you'd probably want a tighter choke. So, so which one for that? Um, mod, light mod, light mod, improved mod, light full, full, okay. um, the funny thing about chokes is, and, and this is totally just my opinion, is there's a lot of it that's kind of personal. It's the okay. choke that makes you feel comfortable with what you're doing. Because one person might be totally comfortable shooting an IC or light mod, and the other person might say, no, I need an improved mod or a full. But the pattern difference, I mean, if you went and patterned those, because we did that at the clinic. Mm -hmm. There isn't a huge difference between the ones in the middle. Yes, there's a huge difference between cylinder and full or extra okay. full. Like if you're turkey hunting, you want extra full because you're aiming for the, the neck of the turkey. And a lot of times they're far away. So you want that, those BBs to all stay together <clears throat> for as long as possible. Mm -hmm. But it's, you know, there's a difference there. But when you get in the middle, I mean, I, having someone say, you know, what's the difference between a mod and an improved mod? I mean, I'd probably say most people could pattern that and not even really tell the difference. Mm -hmm. So okay. it's a lot, I feel personally that a lot of it has to do with the person that's shooting it and how comfortable they are. Obviously there's definitely, you know, guidelines, but it's going to be something that's 
you kind of have to figure out in the field too. So, okay. Can you go through the lineup of, um, of, of what it is from the tightest pattern to the most open? Okay. So the tightest pattern would be like extra full. Okay. So that would be like for turkey hunting and then a okay. full and different companies have different constrictions. So, so not everybody offers all of these. Okay. So, but extra full, full, light full, improved mod, mod, um, light mod. I usually go the other way around. Um, improved cylinder, skeet, and then cylinder. So what would we use cylinder for? Um, something right up close. So let's say a rabbit target, like in sporting clays. Or if you've got something, I mean, in a hunting situation, if you know you've got birds that are flying, let's say um, preserve birds that aren't really going to get out there too far in front of you, mm -hmm. um, maybe something like that. Okay. Because it's basically the same diameter as the barrel. When you talk about the cylinder, it's, it's not constricting anything. It's just the same as the barrel. Okay. So what about um, the best choke to have on top versus bottoms on a break open field gun? I'd probably say um, a more opened choke on the bottom because your first shot is typically going to be closer and then a tighter choke on the top. So whatever you choose. So if a light mod on the bottom, a mod on the top or a mod and an improved mod or, um, or an improved mod on a full. So just the one step up especially if you're in the field, because that second shot is, you know, if the bird's flying away, typically um, having that a little extra, little extra uh, distance, would you, you would want a second, a tighter choke for that second shot. Okay. And again, that's my opinion. So on the chokes, they have different markings. What do those markings mean on them? It depends on the manufacturer. Because we actually, uh, at Caesar Greeny and Fabron, we don't have the little notches um, and mm -hmm. the marks on there. Um, different, just depends. I know there are um, um, numbers that go with those, but it just depends on the gun manufacturer and, and what they've got. So you just, it's, it's different for everybody. So it's like for us, we just have the initials of what this, what the choke is. So SK for skeet, IC for, for, um, improved cylinder, you know, LM for light mod, et cetera. Okay. What about which chokes are safe to shoot steel through? Um, let me go back to that one just a minute. Actually, okay. I realized on our field guns, they do have the notches. Um, and I have to tell you, I don't, I don't look at them often enough to be able to mm -hmm. tell you right off the top of my head but they'll have a, the amount of notches will be based on, on the choke constriction. So, but it'll say okay. on the side of the choke, what it is, and then they'll have corresponding, but I would say that it's probably different for different manufacturers. Okay. So just the field guns have the notches on them. Uh, the, in, yeah, the flush, the flush chokes could, because they're going to be flush with the barrel and you uh -huh. don't see the extended part, so you can look down and see what it is from the inside without having to take it out. So yes. Okay. Okay. So, but on your, um, on your sporting guns, they have the extended one on them, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I did. I did notice that difference the other weekend. And so, what would be the purpose of that? It gives a. Okay. It gives a tighter pattern. More than anything, it's just so they can take them in and out with their fingers without a oh. wrench. It's just easier because they're going station to station. Yes. Okay. I know. It's, and, and some of the, there are some other aftermarket brands that do some, some funky things with their chokes and they port them and do all sorts of cool stuff. But um, bottom line is for ours, it's, it's really just for ease of in and out. Um, so what about steel? Steel's going to be based on usually based on the location. So in waterfowl hunting, because you're in wetlands and that kind of stuff, it's going to be for steel, but there are some preserves that I've been to that even just shooting, um, upland game that you had to shoot steel. It's mm -hmm. just, um, the lead, they're worried about the lead. So it's, um, depends, but for the most part, it's just waterfowl hunting typically. Okay. 
So let's, with that, let's move right over to the topic of ammo um, and on that. So lead versus non-tox. So for non-tox, we have the option of steel, bismuth, and tungsten. Um, what, can you touch on that on, I guess, what would maybe be the difference with those? Um, I'm not super educated on the difference between all three of those. I do know the difference in the fact that a lot in obviously the lead versus the non-toxic. So they're going to say for waterfowl hunting, um, you're going to need those three. There is differences in how, um, hard they are. And so it's, people have, it's kind of, <laughs> I would probably say it's a little bit of, um, a little bit of voodoo kind of people, guys are going to tell you what they want and what they're comfortable with. They'll go out and shoot it and say, oh, but this works better for me. Um, mm -hmm. But you get a, but he might not be as good a hunter as the guy using steel. And um, the, the guy with steel says it's better or girl for that matter. <laughs> I should always right. say girls. Um, <laughs> It's, and again, it comes to personal preference and it's also what the preserve is going to uh, require. Um, different places are going to say that they want, especially if you're going on a guided hunt, that they want one versus the other. So that's something to always remember if you're going to a lodge or a preserve to make sure you call ahead of time to see what they require when it comes to ammo. Uh, with the cost difference, I mean, do you think that um, it's worth the difference? of cost of the steel versus the tungsten or bismuth? I think it probably depends um, whether, how, how many shots it takes you to get the birds down. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> yes. I mean, I have a friend in Texas who can take out 15 shells and come back with 15 doves and mm -hmm. I'm not really that person. So um, <laughs> I probably need two or three shots um, per bird. But, uh, so if you're a really good shot, then yes, I think, and I hate to put it on that, but there's a lot to do with that. So if you, if you have to buy three boxes to get your limit versus one box of the other of the tungsten bismuth, then maybe you are saving money. So right. again, I know it's, it's people are, people are going to read what they're going to read and they're going to come up with their own theories. Um, because again, if I have to go through a whole box to get five birds, and my, you know, girlfriend over here is a better shot and she can do five birds with five shells, then she's obviously spending a whole lot less money than I am. Mm -hmm. So it's right. worth it for her to buy that, but maybe not worth it for me because it takes me a few more shots. Sure. So, you know, it's, I, I can't tell you either way. Um, it's going to be that personal person's preference because I know for me personally, there's things that I am willing to spend more money on and other things I just go, Oh my gosh, I can't believe how expensive that is. And it's not even that expensive. It's just that what I've got in my brain of what I'm, what my value is. So. Okay. I mean, now that California is, it's mandated completely non-tox. Do you think more states are going to start going that direction? I sure hope not. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I, I hope not. Cause I think that it's, um, it's detrimental for the shooters in the economy. And if you make everybody shoot non-toxic lead, I mean, or non-tox um, shells, then you damage the, the economy of the shooting community. And it's um, with the reclamation that they can do at, especially like sporting clay shoot uh, targets, target ranges and that kind of stuff where they come in mm -hmm. and reclaim the, the lead. I mean, it's not like it's, it's sitting there forever. Um, it is getting recycled and reused again and again. And um, I just, politically, I think that that's a, a bad move. Okay. Um, all right. So I'm going into a sporting store, a sporting goods store, and there's three, four different rows of ammo. So here's my issue. <laughs> <laughs> all the different options and then I so I can narrow it down I go okay there's 20 gauge and there's a uh, um, six so I'm going for pheasant today I'm going to get 20 gauge six and then all the different weights uh I've shot plenty of birds with a two and three quarter shell like you can get a nice little like a heavy dove load or a heavy game load in a two and three quarter inch shell um, okay. Yes, you can certainly shoot a three or a three and a half inch shell, 
Um, there is definitely more pellets in there. So if you aren't a great shot, then maybe you need that. But not all guns take three and a half inch. Most hunting guns will take three inch, but not all will take three and a half. And then there's the people, and I'll say guys, that'll say, oh, they have to have a three and a half inch shell or a three inch. And it's just, again, it's what they've got in their head that they believe gives them confidence. Um, I know that I've killed enough doves with my little two and three quarter inch shells and I'm okay with that. And if I miss mm -hmm. a few and maybe I could have hit them with a three inch, how do I know? Um, I don't, I think maybe for some of the bigger birds, it would maybe help having a three inch, um, especially a pheasant or obviously a like goose, but, um, you know, it's, it depends on how good a shot you are. Okay. I mean, I mean we're, we keep coming to that. I, <laughs> It makes a difference, which, you know, practice, practice, practice. <laughs> oh man. So if you're in the, in the aisle with me, in the ammo aisle with me, what is it you're going to, what are you going to tell me if you're by my side of what I should buy? So I, over the years I've shot so all different brands, all, I mean, everything from super light, low recoil to super heavy. And I figured out my spec. So when everybody asks me, hey, what, what, what shells do you shoot? Or if I ask them, what shells do you shoot? And they give me a brand. I say, okay, that tells me nothing. That's mm -hmm. like saying, oh, you know, those blue shoes. I'm like, okay, well, they're blue. Like that could be anything. Um, so I figured out the specs that I like for sporting clays. So if it's a two and three quarter a dram shell with um, 1,200 feet per second, and it's, let's say, seven and a half shot. Um, for sporting clays or eights. Um, that's what I look for. And then I, because sometimes if I'm going to look for shells, I can't find the brand that I want with that spec. So if I can find that spec with another brand, I'm going to be pretty happy with how it feels and the confidence that it gives me that that's the shell that I'm comfortable with. Um, okay. When it comes to hunting, same thing. It's figure out the spec that you want that, and, and it takes some time. It takes going out. Sometimes it takes buying four or five boxes of four or five different um, specs and shooting them and saying, you know, start with the, the low end stuff, not low end cost wise, but the low, low recoil or, or just take five different ones and kind of line them up to where it's the lighter, lower recoil and then move up to the more hotter recoil or hotter loads and then see which one you like the best. And maybe take them hunting. So what are the differences I'm going to notice from uh, like a cheaper shell versus a more expensive one when I'm shooting them? Um, a lot of times it's just um, like a dirty barrel, like a dirty shell. Like you'll just have more gunpowder in, um, uh, in the barrel. I don't think, I think if you're shooting tens of thousands of rounds, like some of these sporting clay shooters and trap shooters are, then yes, mm -hmm. you notice. But for a field hunter that's just going out and shooting maybe 25 shots a day, like you're probably not going to notice that much difference. Okay. Um, I think you'll notice more of a difference between a two and three quarter dram, a three dram and a three and a quarter dram, like, like the hotter, because that's how much gunpowder is in there. And then um, the feet per second. Um, and a lot of times feet per second also equates to more felt recoil because obviously you have to have a bit more of a blast to get it to go faster. So, um, and then asking for recommendations. I mean, looking up for stuff like this, listening to your podcast and saying, here, what does Courtney say? Um, mm -hmm. And I did an article in uh, the Women's Outdoor News on this too, because I think there is a lot of question. So when I go in, and a lot of times the stores will have, hot stuff because most of the people buying them are men and they want, they think hotter is better. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, living in Texas is, is 110 better than a hundred. I mean, not always hotter. Isn't always better. Right. Um, and I've gotten that a lot from girls. They don't want to get beat up. Granted, if you're out in the field and you're not, and you're only shooting 25 over the course of a day and you've got, you know, you're in Montana, let's say, and it's kind of chilly and you've got some layers on, you've got some, you've got some padding, but again, and then a flushing bird, there's so much adrenaline, you typically don't even feel the shot. So you can have something a little bit heavier because obviously you want it, you want it to get to the bird. 
but there's a lot of guys that can tell you all the technical stuff, like the feet per second and shot size and how all that relates. I don't really get into the technical part of it. I get into more of the feel of it and how I'm feeling and what gives me the confidence. Okay. I know that's a little bit vague and not specific. But. Not really. And it's, it's okay because honestly, I don't want to get technical. I don't understand it personally. So the less options and technicalities involved in making these decisions when I'm in the aisle, the better. I just want to know what I should be looking for when I'm going pheasant hunting. What should I be looking for when I go rough, rough grouse hunting? Which one should I grab at that, you know, for that bird? And, well, and so, so yeah, go ahead. Is that going to be a difference? Well, and that's the thing when if, like, if you're going to a preserve or you're going somewhere, they, a lot of times will put on there, we recommend, you know, this shot and this gauge for our birds or call some people, look online. I mean, you can Google that and there'll be a thousand plus different opinions on what you should shoot for each animal. And, but again, I think if you've got some time ahead of time, ahead of your hunt to go in and say, okay, I'm just going to buy one box of each of the, of three or four and take the time. Because if, if you're going to go, especially if you're going to go pay for a hunt, mm -hmm. um, it's to your about your own best interest to say, I want to feel so comfortable with my ammo and not be, um, not that not be a variable when I get there to how I, how it's going to feel because I've gotten handed boxes of shells over the years and, Oh, just shoot this. And about took my shoulder off. And, um, I wasn't very happy about that. So, right. but getting kind of doing your own research, um, is important. And I would advise for a lot of ladies to not necessarily listen to the men, especially big men, a big guy can take a whole lot more recoil than a five, five girl. Um, you know, especially if she's more of a new shooter. Um, and yeah. I wouldn't, I mean, you're not going to probably get great info from a sales clerk, especially in a big box store. If you go to a smaller kind of more um, mom and pop per se kind of store, like a, you know, just more of a custom place, mm -hmm. you could probably get that guy to tell you a whole lot more. I mean, people will give you information. Um, you just kind of have to look for it sometimes. And, um, but you have to kind of look for it in the right place. Big box stores are not going to be where you get that. Okay. So. Which, what ammo um, brand do you prefer? Do you shoot with? <laughs> I like what I said earlier. I have so many different, I've shot it all. And honestly, I don't really have a favorite per se. I have a favorite spec that I like. I like to shoot a two and three quarter dram, 1200 feet per second. Um, usually a one ounce um, or even a seven, eight ounce. If I'm just practicing, um, I use seven, eight ounce for all my demos because I don't, I want the girls to have a really great experience and it's so low recoil. Okay. But for competitions, I'm usually shooting a one ounce. But when you travel, sometimes if you're flying, you have to buy whatever's available. But if you can buy the spec that you want, no matter what the brand is, you, it'll, it'll give you that comfort level. Okay. And, you know, right now I just feel like we're having this major ammo shortage everywhere. We're supposed to be shooting tonight with friends actually. And I need to go to the store and get some shells. and I. I'm just, I'm worried because last time we were there, there was only one box left on the shelf for 20 gauge seven or eights just to, you know, shoot for practice. <laughs> so, you know, I think we're going to have to be making decisions right now of not necessarily what would be preferred, but just what's available. That I, I get it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's funny because I have some, some like one and an eighth ounce heavy stuff in my mud room that I'm like, I'm think I'm going to find someone to trade that out for because it's just not stuff that I want to shoot. I do like lower recoil. I do like it fast. I mean, I like it going, I mean, I like a 1200 feet per second, but you can change those specs even just a little bit and it can really affect how your gun feels. So mm -hmm. um, it's important to do some trial and error and see, and I've taken people out and um, especially guys, they like, they think hotter is better. And I've, I believe that um, sometimes backing off on that a little bit helps you stay focused and prevents you from getting um, fatigued as quickly. And so mm -hmm. I think you, you shoot better longer. So, so what would be considered a hot shell? 
oh, like, uh, you know, anything that says handicap, super sport, nitro, um, 1,350 feet per second. We've got some 1,400 feet super crushers, like stuff like that. <laughs> heavy dove loads, heavy game loads, ex, you know, heavy target loads. I mean, I go for the stuff, um, you know, for extra light target loads, low recoil. I mean, because it's just – you know, there's something for everybody. And if they feel, and you know, if they feel that that's what they want and they need, then more power to them. I yeah. just, I'm Nitro, not sure. Make a load. Like, yeah, so anything they, that basically sounds like an American gladiator name, it's out. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> because I've shot 1350 super sport uh, Winchesters and I'll tell you, they'll knock you, they'll, they'll leave a bruise. And, and I don't think that that's the, that you need that. I think you can still have a lot of really great success, especially in the field and in the sporting clays course um, or shooting any kind of thing with a lighter load. It doesn't have to be super hot. Okay. And I'll probably get lots of argument over that with anybody I talk to. So, <laughs> but I like getting <laughs> well, on my it's a hot topic. Soapbox. It is. And, yeah. and I get on my soapbox on a regular basis and, and that's okay. <laughs> People let me go on and on. And, um, but I think that it's important to, to feel comfortable. And at the end of the day, not being sore and mm -hmm. not feeling like, Oh my God, here comes that shot and flinching. Cause I think that that is something that creates flinching. So it's just, right. uh, and I think that all goes hand in hand with just the women feeling comfortable with shooting in general. It's one thing for them to pick up a gun a lot of times. Um, yes. and, it, and then it's that anticipation of, pulling the trigger and what, what it's going to feel like. Is it going to bring me pain? And I heard so many women at that clinic with just saying that exactly that. I, I just don't want to hurt when I shoot. That's their and, number one fear. Yeah. That's why sometimes um, when I first take lessons out or do demos is I'll just let them pull the trigger. We won't even pull a target. Mm -hmm. And they look at me with this amazement because we're shooting a seven, eight ounce, you know, 1200 feet per second, low recoil in a 12 gauge. And they say, that didn't hurt. And I say, mm -hmm. I know. And they go, oh, and you've eliminated that fear instantly. And I go, okay, now we can work on targets. And it's right. just gone because so many people have um, gotten beat up and guys have been like man up and, you know, just, you know, stick with it. And it just, I feel like sometimes they do it on purpose because they don't want them to have a good time. But it's a great, it's so easy to have a great experience with low recoil shells. Yeah, it, it definitely makes it more enjoyable. And it's something that, you know, like I think you mentioned earlier, when the bird's getting up and your adrenaline's going, you know, even if I did shoot something that would hurt, um, and to be honest, there was, last year, there was um, the next day I had bruising all over my arm because the gun I had at that time wasn't obviously in the right spot, but I didn't right. even notice the pain at the time because right. I was just so caught up in dogs on point, get over there, birds up, shoot, you know, and so that's, that stuff happens and you don't realize it. But when you're out there shooting 25 rounds, you're definitely going to notice. Or a hundred or 200. I mean, some of these kids are shooting... Right three or 400 targets over the course of a weekend at some of these events. And mm -hmm. a lot of times on Sunday afternoon, they totally tank because they've just mm -hmm. gotten beat up so long. So, and, and they aren't, they just aren't set up for it. And then if you're shooting shells that are hot, it'll, it'll have an effect on you by that Sunday afternoon for sure. Yeah, absolutely. So touching on that with, for kids, um, you know, as we have the six year old and, um, want to kind of get him started and comfortable with shooting a shotgun, what would you recommend as a good starter gun for a young kid? When I, over the last 20 years, I've heard people say, oh, get her a 410 or get that kid a 410. And I, I have learned that I totally disagree with that. Okay. Because I consider a 410 a expert's gun. Mm -hmm. You've only got, I mean, you've got the difference between a shot shell that's maybe as big as your thumb versus now you've got this shot shell that's as big as your pinky finger. And so there's such a, a fewer amount of pellets in there, BBs in there to hit the target um, that it's just, it's hard. And, and guys that go shoot 410 are typically challenging themselves 
to, you know, to, to be able to hit with the 410. Mm -hmm. I think a 20 gauge or a 28 gauge are much better options. If you can get a 20 gauge semi-auto, um, there's lots of kids that start on that. You can get, you can get enough pellets and BBs in that shell that they can have some success and have a good time and then move up. Um, okay. so I, I, every time somebody says a 410, I say, yeah, no. Um, but I'd say a 28 gauge has usually has a really good pattern or a 20, uh, or a 20 gauge. Tell oh. me which gun that you have that can do that job. So we do have, um, a 28, 20 and a 28 gauge field guns. Um, the Tempio, the Siren Tempio, and then mm -hmm. the, um, like the D2, the Fab Arm, uh, Siren D2, Elos D2. I love it. Um, yes. Oh, I know. It's beautiful. I love that it gun, is. but it's in 20 and 28 gauge and they're okay. light, they're light enough weight. Now six is, you know, it's a bit young. He's maybe going to get, be able to shoot maybe two or yeah. three or four, but right. as you know, they get big fast. Right. Um, and then, and they'll probably still be too long, obviously for that size child, but, yeah. um, and then in even starting them out with a BB gun. Um, I know that at least Yes, that's point. That's aiming versus pointing, but at least it mm -hmm. kind of gets them, you know, focusing. So yeah, yep. um, he's got that. He's he loves that. Put little clay targets out there for him, just to stationary for him to shoot at, and he likes seeing those explode. So yeah, I mean, and and that does make a difference. Just getting them mm -hmm. excited about it more than anything, and because if you tried something, and even some of the women, it's like if you give them a four ten and they can't hit anything. And they go, oh, well, that's not fun. Right. So, but if you give them a 20 or a 28 gauge and they can hit something and not get beat up, even better. And I tell them all, I've had women that show up and I used to ask a question and I still do sometimes is how many of you were t told that you couldn't handle a 12 gauge? And I used to get about 50 to 75% of them will raise their hand. Hmm. I think that's total baloney because mm -hmm. I've got myself, I've got girls on my pro staff. I've seen enough women and young girls shoot 12 gauges really well. And you can shoot whatever gauge you want. If you want to shoot a 20, 28, whatever, that's great. I just don't want any woman to think that she can't handle a 12 gauge. Because she So what's the difference then? Why, why should somebody choose a 20 over a 12, vice versa? Um, so obviously there's a lot more pellets. I mean, if you look at a 410, a 28 gauge, a 20 and a 12 gauge, and then even like a 10 gauge, you know, there's a, the size of the shell is different. And so therein lies the amount of BBs inside that shell increases mm -hmm. as you um, go up. And so you've got more opportunities for that BB to hit your target, whatever it is. Now, well, the thing is, though, is I'm shooting a seven eighths ounce, but then in the ounces is going to tell you how much shot is in that shell. So if you shoot a one ounce 12 gauge, I mean, or, or a seven eighths. So I shoot a seven eighths a lot of times, a seven eighths ounce 12 gauge. Well, that's okay. actually the same amount of BBs in a seven eighths ounce 20 gauge. So, but you've got, but I, that's what I like about um, shooting those for my demos in the 12 gauge is because there's so much less recoil. There's more mass in the 12 gauge to absorb that. So you have felt less felt recoil, but you can still hit targets with it. Obviously back to the whole hot shells, people like it goes up to one and an eighth or even one and a quarter. Um, so it's um, having more BBs obviously gives you more of a chance of hitting things. Um, gauges is, is, a lot of sporting clays ranges are set up for 12 gauge. That's they're they're determined. They set the targets based on ex the expectation that people are shooting a 12 gauge because then they'll have, especially in big tournaments, they'll have a 20 gauge um, or a sub gauge course, which will have different setups for 20, 28, and then even a different one for 410. Because you're not because there isn't the distance. You can't get the distance in uh, a 410 or a 28 gauge that you really can with a 12. Okay. I was, and th thank you for saying that. Cause I was just wondering like, what would be the difference of how would you know it's a 12 gauge course versus a 20 gauge course? So it's distance then that's what would determine. Typically, but you could, I mean, there's people that do shoot 20 gauge, um, mm -hmm. at a 12 gauge course. I mean, it doesn't mandate that it is, it's just that you're going to have better success birds. Right. Okay. Um, I know I've been to, to preserves and I've been to hunting locations where 
they didn't allow for a 12 gauge. Um, huh. You had to shoot a 20 gauge or lower. Um, depends on you know the birds that you're shooting. I mean, if you're shooting, um, doves are going fast, um, and sometimes they're far out. But there's also you don't necessarily want to have a mouthful of BBs and obliterate. I've seen I've seen guns, you know, obliterate birds um, in the field because there were so many pellets and the person shot it so close that there was nothing left. Mm -hmm. So there's kind of that too. I mean, you want to gauge um, your prey with your with your ammo it's kind of like when you shoot big game versus varmints versus you know squirrels and rabbits versus deer and elk i mean you need a bigger bullet to kill a bigger animal okay pheasant hunting what would you use 20 or 12 um probably a 12 okay. um unfortunately siren doesn't make a 12 gauge field gun right now so i've taken out my sporting gun when i've shot yeah. pheasant, um because yeah. it was what i had but um, we've been, we've talked about doing a, a, a 12 gauge field gun, um, for 2021, which would be nice. And I get lots of ladies that ask for it. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's not, it's not something we have right now, but you can, um, you can certainly shoot it, but I would probably say you can definitely shoot 20 gauge with pheasants, but maybe you have, um, and this was something that I've read too. It's again, the shot size versus the velocity, and that's kind of stuff. So maybe you have a 20 gauge that's a little bit hotter with um, number four shot um, versus five or six. So it just, and again, I mean, that's one of those things too. Talk to the guide, talk to the place where you're going to hunt, talk to other people that you've hunted with that hunt that type of animal. Um, I would not proclaim that I'm an expert at any of that, but I mean, I would go and get the information. Mm -hmm. and seek it well, out. The waterfowl gun is a 12 gauge and yes. um, so that can be, that would be a good option for pheasant too, wouldn't it? Yes and no. Personally, I wouldn't want to carry a semi-auto in the field. Um, uh -huh. I like a, an over and under just because even just for ease of carrying, um, okay. even if you have a sling, I like to be able to have the gun open over my shoulder um, or mm -hmm. carry it in the crook of my arm. Whereas I find that walking a field with a semi-auto would be uncomfortable and inconvenient, <laughs> but, and, I, and, yeah. then, and, then, oh, and then you got to go chase down your, your hulls every time you shoot. And I, I like to be able to pull them out and stick them in the back of my vest. Um, so that I'm not leaving them on the ground. Yeah. Good so, point. But that's, yeah. that's me personally in a duck blind or stuff like that. It's a little bit easier because typically you're in a kind of a confined space um, in a blind. And so your shells out of your semi-auto pretty much stay within the range of where mm -hmm. you are and they're floating on the water. So you can just pick them up. I guess it depends on how nice your duck blind is. Sometimes you're in the water and sometimes <laughs> you're not, but it just you're depends right. on what the options are. Digging around in the weeds next to you. Yes, yeah, that too. Cattails. <laughs> Um, for a woman new to hunting, what would you recommend for a good all around gun? So somebody, um, if she wants to do pheasant, grouse, um, turkey, waterfall, what would be a good option? Well, if you take the waterfowl out of that, because <laughs> most <laughs> people that are going to take their field gun, like, do you really want to take your Tempia light out into the water? No, into the they marsh? don't. They don't. That's why I'm okay. getting waterfowl, right. hopefully. <laughs> well, so, so that's the thing. I mean, girls ask me that all the time. They're like, oh, yeah. I just want one gun that does everything. And I'm like, okay, well, let's go to your shoe closet. And I can guarantee you that there's not one pair of shoes in here that does every single outfit that you want. It just, it's just not realistic. And I understand you that. Know, take that Got back because I, I did just get those new boots that same ones that you have. And I do feel like I can wear those to every event. <laughs> yes. The Fairfax in favor. Yes. I can wear them with a the dress. I can wear them in the field. I, I could actually, yes. I could even run in them if I had to, um, not a marathon, but certainly uh -huh. you know, run away from something if I needed. Could wear them to a wedding. Yeah, the girls in England do. They show pictures of that all the time under the wedding yeah. dress. Yeah. Um, totally. Okay. So yeah, I'll take that back. Um, <laughs> but I'd probably say, um, that's the kind of the tough part about my job is I'm like, well, buy three, <laughs> you know, and we yeah. were like, yeah, 
do that. So they want something. And I tell them a lot of times, if you've got a gun that's got two barrels and you can put bullets in there, you know, you can basically do whatever you want with it. Um, mm -hmm. Waterfowl. Yes. You could take that, that waterfowler with the camo and you could shoot sporting clays with it. You can, you know, hunt with it. You could, you could do whatever you need to obviously. Um, and vice versa for the over and unders for any of the guns. Um, best, mm -hmm. obviously it's nice to have a gun per discipline. And I think you're, you know, obviously your siren tempio light, um, with your daughter on your back and, and you know, walking <laughs> through the field is nice having a super light gun to yeah. walk through the field with versus, you know, an eight pound sporting gate, you know, sporting 12 gauge. Um, there's a big difference there. So it's, but having something like a sporting gun is a lot easier to do a lot of different things with. Um, okay. You could take a 20 gauge sporting gun in the field, you know, waterfowling. You just got to make sure, well, and we'll get to the next thing is making sure you clean it afterwards, especially if you're taking it in the marsh. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, and it depends on what your budget is too. If you can buy two guns, you can buy a Tempulite and a waterfowler, or if you want to buy one, you know, that D2. I mean, you could certainly, that's, I call it a crossover gun. It's, yeah. it's got a pistol grip. Um, it's got beautiful birds and case colored receiver and you could shoot sporting clays with it. Obviously you can shoot, um, targets, but you could also take that in the field. Definitely. Mm -hmm. So yeah. they are kind of, I mean, people don't always want to take their nice gun into the field, but, um, I feel like if I needed it and I tell them they can shoot burgers with it too, if they need to, you know. <laughs> whatever yeah. if you stick two bullets in there where you go yeah and i am and i i'm a huge fan of a very versatile nice you know pr versatile and pretty things i'm gonna i'm gonna leave it at those two to sum it up but i do feel that with a 20 gauge tempio light i do feel i could be just as happy with that as my waterfall gun um as i am with the upland um and my dogs, I have the German wire hair pointers and they are the ultimate versatile dog. They can do fur and feather and upland and waterfowl and same as the boots. They can, they can go everywhere too. But I just think, you know, and a friend told me the other day, she said, oh, it's so pretty, but it's almost too pretty to shoot that gun. And I'm like, no, you know, my dogs are very well-trained, very expensive dogs. And I put them through the gamut. Why wouldn't yeah. I put yeah. my gun through the gamut? Be ashamed to have dogs like that and then not hunt them. Right. And, right. And, and, we, and we do worry about them getting hurt or getting bruised, you know, when they're out there, same as I would with my gun. But, you know, I put a lot of money into the sport that I enjoy and I expect great dogs. I want to have a great gun. And, uh, you know, I just think it's so similar for the, the two basics. Well, the cool thing about the, the, especially the Tempio, the Caesar Garini sirens, um, and you know, this firsthand is that if you get a little scratch or dings on it, mm -hmm. um, it's an oil finish. It's not right. a polyurethane finish. So you can realistically, um, take a little, you know, fine grain and sandpaper and sand that little scratch out. And then you can mm -hmm. add some oil and in nice thin coats and letting it dry in between and won't even know it's there. Um, I know too, that when they, people send their guns back into the shop to get them refinished, um, they steam out some of the dents and they polish them all up. And people have, have called and said, this looks like a brand new stock because right. of what, you know, because it is an oil finish, but you can maintain it. And okay. Yeah. It gets a little ding and stuff, but the only way a gun's never going to have anything wrong with it is if you leave it in the box or stick it in the safe and never get to play with it. And that's shameful too. I mean, it what's is. the fun in that? Right. I mean, but again, it's all back to kind of what you said, what we were talking about earlier is what the value is to you. You know, for you, that gun is a tool. It is something, yes, it's beautiful, but it is also a tool for you to, to get to do what you want to do with the dogs. Right. So, um, the only thing, and then on the flip side of a gun that does everything, the only thing is I probably wouldn't want you to do with that Tempio light is go shoot a hundred rounds of sporting clays. Yeah. Um, because I think that there's so little weight and there's so little mass to absorb that unless you were shooting super light shells. Um, you're going to feel that at the end. Yeah. 25 or 50, you'd probably be fine, but not consistently. It's a little too light for that. 
Yeah. And I am actually going to use it um, to go shooting tonight and I need to go get shells today. So should I go get eights? <laughs> Well, I would say, um, we, you need to call me before we, before you go or when you're there and, and we'll have a, you can, you can tell a me. Personal consultant. Couch. I there know that's, go. that's going to be the problem, isn't it? Is I'm going to get there looking for eights just to have fun with my friends tonight. And then there's going to be a box of sixes <laughs> and I'm going to go, Oh, uh, I'll watch you guys and sit here and have a drink while you guys all get to shoot. <laughs> yeah. But the fun thing, I, I walked into a store one time and there was, all the one and an eighth ounce heavy stuff was all gone. And there was some light recoil seven, eight ounce on the shelf. And I bought like eight boxes because it was literally an empty shelf except for these boxes. And I was like, well, I'll take these. This is what I want. So it's all kind of, so sometimes you can get lucky and the guys who think they want everything else, um, the girls will say, okay, I'll, I'll just take this extra stuff. So Mm -hmm. But velocity and your dram. Your dram's important. You want to make sure you're shooting a two and three quarter dram. Um, two and three quarter. Okay. Dram. There's two and three quarter inch, and then there's two and three quarter dram, and then there's three dram and three and a quarter. So you don't want the heavy stuff. You want two and three quarter inches, two and three quarter dram. The size of your shot, seven and a half, eights, eight, you know, nines, that's whatever you can get. Okay. Cool, because I am the one going into town today to get we'll ammo, not my husband. So yes. <laughs> I need I to know what I'm looking for. Consultation for sure. <laughs> okay. Anytime. I'll FaceTime you so you can actually help me with the overwhelmingness of the shelves. <laughs> I, I've been there. I get it. <laughs> okay. So you were talking about gun cleaning just a little bit ago. So let's, let's hop into that. Um, how often should we be cleaning our guns? Well, so there's kind of different, it's kind of like your house, (laughs) you know, it's like Mm -hmm. there's the kind of tidying up all the clutter and just kind of putting everything away for when guests come in. And then there's, oh, my mother-in-law is coming and there's the deep clean. So Mm -hmm. if you kind of take it by that is, um, we use a product called G96. Um, it's pretty common. You can get it on Amazon or wherever. Um, and the nice thing about it is you can wipe it on the metal and the wood. Um, okay. And so as a daily, after you shoot, wiping down the gun, um, we also use um, flower sack cloths. You can get them at Walmart for like five Hmm. bucks, like four of them. And the nice thing about it is the way it's woven, it doesn't have, it's not like a terry cloth that has like the little hooks to catch on things. It's a weave and um, they're cheap. They work great. You just, you have a few of those carrying, you know, and you just keep using them over and over and over again. And they kind of build up the oil on them. And the, the key that I, one of the things I learned too was never, you don't want to spray the oil or any of anything onto the gun directly because there's propellants in that spray that can damage the wood and the metal. So you spray okay. it on the rag first and then you wipe it down. So between, especially in the summertime, we've got sunscreen and bug spray and oil and sweat and salt and all that stuff on our bodies, on our face, on our hands. So wiping down the gun, like a, you know, just a quick wipe down, you know, just, it doesn't have to be super in depth. Um, every time you shoot is important. Um, every time. I, yeah, I'd probably say because okay. I mean, if your hands are sweaty and, and um, you've got salt and you're leaving all that kind of stuff on the gun, if you're just wiping it down, I mean, it takes, I mean, literally this is like a 30 second wipe down. This is not, you know, a deep cleaning. This is just, I'm wiping off all the grit and the grime and the, the stuff that I've put on there. Okay. And that's the kind of thing that you should have in your gun bag, you know, just a, a rag and, and this stuff or in the car when you get back to the car before you put the gun in the, in the, the slip. And then deeper cleaning, you know, after, you know, once every couple of weeks or depending on, it, it's, it's more kind of after the, what you've been shooting. I mean, if you're taking it out in the field, then yeah, I think it's important to, um, you know, maybe run a, a bore through this you know, snake bore through the barrels to just get kind of the junk out. Um, one of the things that I've probably learned more than anything is the fact that if you've got some grease. Um, which is important, you know, on the hinges and not too much, but just a little bit of grease in there. And if it gets dirty and then you don't clean out the old grease before you put the new grease on, it creates a lapping compound. 
um, and I, when girls look at me with, you know, glazed over eyes when I say that and I say, Hey, yeah. have you ever put on lip gloss and then gotten in a dust, get, gotten in a dust storm or, or you know, when dusty stuff blows and it's like sticks to your lips and then it turns into like a loofah. Basically that's what's happening with the dirt in the grease inside mm-hmm. your gun. So one of the things that's on every single gunsmith counter is a box of Q-tips. I'll tell you, we should probably buy stock and Q-tips when it for gun people because <laughs> getting that grease out from the receiver and just kind of, um, you know, where the barrels are in, you know, interact with the with the um, with the receiver where they're where they're joined up, it, it gets all dirty in there, and so okay. cleaning that stuff out before you put any new grease on there is is important. I'd probably say that's that's pretty good. Is the G96 a spray or is that the grease that you're referring to? No, it's a spray. Okay. Um, which, which one's the grease then? The grease, pretty much anything. Like the guys, um, they have, they, they say, I've, I've asked them and they're like, it doesn't really matter. It just has to be, um, like, you know, Barley's got some, everybody's kind of got some grease that they mm-hmm. use. It doesn't have to be super thick, um, but it doesn't, you know, not too thin either. And it's just a little bit on, um, kind of on the bottom of the receiver where the, um, where it interacts with the, with the barrels and then just on the hinges, but okay. people can overdo it. You just need a little bit, you know, kind of back to that little, what brill cream, a little dabble, do you? Um, mm-hmm. We read a shoot recently and somebody had literally put grease on every single thing inside their receiver. Like all the mechanical parts were coated in mm-hmm. grease. Like it was weird. And not good because then things don't work. Um, you put on there, you ask the question, you say, can get, and, and can they be cleaned too much? Right. Um, not really, but you can add too much oil. Some people okay. think that like spraying in spraying stuff inside their firing pins or, um, coating it with oil. It's like, the thing is, is you don't want to do that because then that oil will, um, leak into the, like the stock. Um, and then it makes the wood weak and then you basically, and then it'll flake and damage your stock. Um, and then you have to replace the stock because it's really not something you can fix. So having too much oil, it's kind of the same thing as too much grease. Like you you just, just a little bit and you should, you should never leave it like dripping. It should always be wiped off a thin coat. So we're putting grease in the mechanics. Where are we putting the oil? Um, that's more for kind of your semi-autos. Um, just, you know, there's, there's a, there's a video on, um, the fab arm page and also the siren page that shows you our senior gunsmith, Andrew has, um, done some videos about where to put it. Okay. I'm going to, I'll put that link in our show notes then if you can send that to me. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, Andrew's famous for his videos. He's got a long beard. Everybody, everybody wants to meet Andrew. So it's just, okay. and, and getting good information from the manufacturer, because there's a lot of people that'll tell you a lot of things that are not the right way to do it. And mm-hmm. we see them in the gun shop all the time, or they see them in the gun shop. And then every once in a while I see it. But um, if you're ever curious, I mean, call the office and say, Hey guys, what do you use or how do you do it? And if there's a video, they'll send you to that or they'll answer your questions. So or if you see them at, a, at an event, those guys will show anybody how to properly maintain their gun. What about storing? So after a hunt, you're putting it in the sleeve. Um, do you keep it in the sleeve for the, uh, for the next weekend? Or should you put it in a gun case um, out of sleeve? I would probably say transporting it in the sleeve. Um we had a customer who left her gun in her sleeve on a pretty regular basis. And it was in hot and cold and humid and air conditioning back and forth. And like the third time she asked to have the gun receiver refinished because it was rusting. It's like, okay, don't do that anymore Mm -hmm. because if you've got a padded sleeve, like it traps moisture and can certainly, you know, make your gun rust. I mean, it's, it's, you know, metal, it, it'll happen. Right. Um, I've seen it happen. And so, um, taking it out, you don't necessarily have to take it apart and store it in your hard case, but just taking it out and not leaving it in a case where it's going, is going to, you know, can be affected by the humidity or moisture. Okay. Um, so it should be taken apart though. 
Um, just depends. I mean, I wouldn't say if, if you've wiped it down. I mean, personally, I mean, if it's it doesn't necessarily have to be taken down. Um, obviously, if it's out in the marsh or and it's gotten all dirty and dropped it in the mud a few times, I'd probably mm -hmm. say then yes, you would want to make sure that you clean it and take it apart. Um, one of the biggest things too is if it ever gets wet, is making sure you take your choke tubes out all the way and letting them dry and then cleaning the the choke tube threads and then um, putting a little grease on those before you put them back in. And actually something that I was showing the girls at the clinic and um, is that the, the choke wrench that you get with the Caesar Greeny guns, mm -hmm. it's got a little handle. And if you unscrew the top, it's a, a thread, a choke thread cleaner. You just screw it into where your choke goes and it will clean the threads. Should those be taken out between shoots as well? Not necessarily. No, okay. I don't think so. But just you know, if it semi, gets wet, get wet or semi regularly to kind of clean them and, and, you know, add a little tiny bit of grease just so they um, don't rust. When you're greasing and going through that process, they should be taken out though for that or doesn't it matter? Yeah, I think so. Okay. And, and again, a little bit, I mean, you're just taking a, a tiny bit and just running a little strip, you know, on your finger and running a little strip down the side. And as you screw it in, it'll coat it does not have to be oopy, you know, gooey and, you know, oozing all that other place. It's just a little bit. I really want to go clean my gun right now. <laughs> <laughs> Weird. Well, and then like, I know like Briley has, um, and, um, like a little wire brush that's got a handle on it. I've got one. I've had it for probably 10 years um, that you can stick down there too. And it'll just kind of scrub it. Um, like if they did get dirty, but I've also known enough people that have gotten choke tubes welded, you know, rusted inside the end of their guns because oh, they never I've heard of that. Out. Yeah. Right. I've seen it. And I mean, and that's, I mean, that's the gunsmith taking a blow torch and that's Ugh. just not a good deal. So what about, Storing in between seasons, if you're only using the gun for hunting season, um, what's the best way to store it for that? If it's going to be a long time. I'd probably say, um, obviously doing a good cleaning, um, before wiping it down with your G96 and, um, making sure that, uh, you aren't leaving kind of any dirt or, oil, you know, excess oil. Um, a lot of times they, if you're putting it in a safe, uh, it's recommended to put it barreled down so that any oil or, or anything that's in the gun would not seep into the, the wood stock. Ah, good um, to know. So there's that. Mm -hmm. I mean, different people tell you different things. Um, sure. and, it, and it, again, depends if you're going to put it in a case in a closet or if it's going to go in a safe is kind of, you know, typically put together standing up in a safe is probably, um, opposed to just depending on how big your safe is, I guess. Right. Um, and then temperature control, check in on that. I know that I told you that it was 94% humidity mm -hmm. on the Eastern shore of Maryland this morning. And, um, I've had people say, check your safe because they'll get humid and they've said guns will rust inside oh, the safe. Wow. Um, how awful to open that not, door. Yeah. There's not humidity control. So, Jeez. um, so there's that kind of thing to consider also depending on okay. where you live. You don't usually have that problem with your 20 some odd percent. Humidity. Yeah. 90 okay. degrees yesterday with the 20% humidity. Pretty amazing. <laughs> we're making sure that you maintain the stock and, um, you know, making sure that it's, um, if you need to add another couple layers of, um, boiled linseed oil, uh, right. and, and, you know, light, nice light coats, um, to keep the stock maintained is important too. Yeah. So. Cause so, I mean, even in our drier weather, can that be detrimental to a gun? Um, I, as far as I know, probably not the metal, um, maybe okay. just the wood. I wouldn't, not that I understand. I mean, again, I'm not a super expert, but it's usually the humidity and the moisture that's going to be the most detrimental to a gun. And what, what kind of oil is good for the stock for the Caesar Guarini guns? Um, boiled linseed oil. There's okay. lots of different brands, but that's typically what they recommend. Okay. We do have a stock uh, repair kit on the website. Um, I guess it depends on how, I mean, it's kind of, it's got a little bottle in there. So it's got, you can buy that like right off the Caesar Greeny and Siren websites. Okay. What else, what else is there 
to discuss. Anything else you wanted to, to touch on? I think more than anything, it's a matter of figuring out what works for you and kind of weeding through all the clutter and all the opinions because everybody has one and just figure out what works and then just stick into that. Mm -hmm. Um, wiping your, I mean, people have said, Oh, well, um, you know, they say my, my finish came off on my receiver or I've got, you know, a spot, a white, you know, clear spot on my, or a silver spot on my barrel, you know, how you hold your gun, you know, there's guns are mechanical instruments and they take, you know, even a basic amount of care and feeding. Um, and they'll last a lot longer if you just take care of them a little bit, um, on the chokes and gauges, it's, it's really very much about figure out what works for you. I tell women all the time, I give you permission to thank whoever gives you the, their opinion and say, I appreciate you telling me that. And then do whatever works for you. Because I, whatever someone, if someone ever says you have to do this, or this is the only way I disagree. I mean, even just where to hold your hand on the, on the forend. Um, I've had people say, well, you have to do it this way. I'm like, no, you don't. You have, you put it where it's comfortable for you. So same with maintenance and all that kind of stuff. I'd probably say the guys that are doing it every day, like our gunsmiths in the shop, those are the guys that if you really want to know what works and what doesn't work, talk to them. Okay. And they're happy to take our phone calls and help us with that. Yeah, we have a gun shop coordinator. He can answer a lot of questions. But if it's if you're a gun owner and you say, "Hey, I really just," I mean, they might call you back later in the afternoon when they're not, you know, working on guns. But they will mm-hmm. talk to you. Yeah. Okay. Or if we're if we're at an event, um, I mean, I've I've had I've watched the gunsmiths show, you know, these young kids or new shooters or new gun owners, um, just the basics. But it's it takes a little bit of responsibility on your part or on the on the part of the shooter to maintain something that you've spent your hard earned money on. Right. Where can we find a list of events that you guys are going to be at? Well, uh, right now, <laughs> <laughs> right. There's right. really much events going on. Everything's pretty mm. much been canceled um, <laughs> or we're not going just due to the whole um, pandemic, but right. it's on the website, um, sirenusa.com. There's also events on GarinaUSA.com and FabArmUSA.com. Um, and then we have the social media links are on, um, are all linked on those websites. Perfect. So you, and, and there's a calendar that we usually, you know, have out there, but there's not much on there right now. Yeah. So are you on the Cesar Garini, FabArm, and Siren event websites? Um, is that going to be all your events combined or is that each brand separate events? Um, A lot. So for like the siren demos, that's not really going to be put on the green and fab arm, but a lot of the larger events that we do um, like the grand American or the national sporting clays, that kind of stuff. Those are on all three. Okay. And how can we find you Lynn? How can we connect with you? Well, um, my, I have Instagram and Facebook, um, under my name, Lynn Green. And then we also have, um, a siren information there too, or in the office, the, um, contact information on the, um, on the website. But I also, my Instagram handle is, um, shooter pie at shooter underscore pie, because I like to shoot and I like to make pies. (laughs) Perfect. (laughs) So that's how you can find me. What's your favorite pie to make? You know, I get asked that all the time and I've decided that is the one I'm making at that moment. <laughs> because like I made a, like a pheasant pot pie a couple weeks Ooh. ago were very well received. Yeah. Um, but I love making fruit pies too. Um, I've been making more savory pies lately, but um, I like to, just depends on the ingredients too that I have available. So you're going to have to send me the recipe for that pheasant pot pie. I will. It I'm was interested really in that. Yes. They ate it. At, one of the guys at the office uh, in the warehouse made the declaration that he didn't like pie the first day. <laughs> and by about four thirty or five o'clock that afternoon, he walked by my desk with a piece and he said, okay, I, I'm just going to try it. <laughs> and the next day he said he had another piece and it was good. He said he'd had a bad experience with pot pie in the past. And so he wasn't sure he wanted to try it, but I think everybody else that had eaten it and said it was good. So 
um, <laughs> he, he, really, he relented and, and ate some. So I was pleased. That's awesome. So what, what gun are you shooting for Upland? What are you using? Uh, depends on like, if I have my gun, because I shoot left, um, I'll just take my 12 gauge sporting out in the field. Okay. Um, mm-hmm. but I have shot that D2, um, for doves and okay. the CEO field. And I really like those two. If, if I had to pick, I'd probably say the D2. Okay. Yeah, my for preference. sure. I love um, that gun. I'd like to have a 12 gauge field gun for siren. Um, I mm-hmm. think that would be nice, but for now I'll just take my sporting. That'll work. Maybe in the works though, right? I hope, you know, I can only just say, Hey, I, I'm going to pitch it. When the guys say, Hey, what guns do you want for 2021? I can say field 12 gauge field gun. Yeah. Can we, can listeners and enthusiasts write in and suggest that as well? That'd be great. <laughs> great. Would that help? Okay. I can, I, it, it, every single little bit will help. Yeah. I mean, I'm making phone calls for advocating for public land this week. So I might as well be calling Cesar Garini office advocating for siren 12 gauge. <laughs> yeah. They've got an info at siren USA and you could just, if, if, if a hundred girls sent in an email that said we want a 12 gauge field gun, um, I could, I could round all those up and yep. pop them on my sales VP and over down. and under please. Yes. yes. Oh yeah, definitely. Yes, definitely. And over and under. Perfect. Um, all right. Oh, your favorite. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm coming up with just some random questions. I just want to hear from you on. Okay. <laughs> but so what's your favorite bird dog breed that you've hunted over? <laughs> <laughs> I I'm going to abstain. I don't really have a favorite. Um okay. I've hunted over different ones, but I don't own one myself. I do have a friend that has some French Britneys. And mm-hmm. um I've hunted with them along with some other dogs and I I don't have a favorite. I think if I was going to buy one, I would probably look into the French Britneys. I'm not a huge fan of the American Britneys, but um mm-hmm. Cause I, cause I think they're very different dogs, yeah. but, uh, I would, that would probably be what I, I like their kind of pocket size. They're not big, big dogs, but mm-hmm. they like to hunt. They're snappy. Yeah. Yeah. And they, and they don't take up the whole seat when, you know, on the, on the, on the golf cart or the, <laughs> the ranger, you know, you can just kind of stick them in the middle there. Um, but they're also great pets, you know, so they, they, um, they do well out of season also and just being really sweet and fun. Right. Going nice dogs to be around. So, so yeah, no, I don't, I don't really have a favorite. Well, have you hunted over German white hair pointers yet? Yes. uh, Oh, okay. Not regularly. So, um, you know, whoever I've gone out with, you know, whatever dogs were available. So, okay. Well, you'll have to come back out to Montana this fall. We can go on a hunt. Ah, twist my arm. Yeah. No, for that. For sure. Perfect. What, what has been your most memorable hunt that you, that you've had? You know, I probably have to say, um, recently when I went to the flying bee ranch in Idaho in February of this year, Mm -hmm. right before we all got locked down, um, I did a hunt with Orvis and the funniest part was, is I actually didn't hunt, but I was hosting and, um, taking these women out and I was taking pictures and watching these ladies get excited and getting to just see the whole thing open up in front of me was almost as equally satisfying as hunting. I, totally. I'd like to go back on my own and you know just go as, as a shooter. I mean, yeah. beautiful terrain. Um, the birds were, you know, flying really well. But capturing that, um, you know, I've had some good hunts, but I'd probably say that like recently in the last, you know, five years, that's probably one of my favorites. Mostly just kind of seeing the, the effect of, um, the whole experience. Cause a lot of these women had never shot over, over dogs mm-hmm. and some of the girls had never even shot birds. So the combination was really kind of fun to see. And, and I think you even got a picture of, of someone that day or that week that she had ha- shot her first pheasant and like the biggest smile on her face yes yeah actually You're i got a right. video that was it. there video yes and and that was that was so exciting to see to see that accomplishment um Absolutely. be realized for her and to know that 
totally hooked her. I mean, mm-hmm. she's like, she's in forever. <laughs> and she's young. I mean, she's only in her early thirties. I mean, to be able to say she'll probably be hunting for the next 50 years, at least. That's um, awesome. Cause and then there was it's all about. Were yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it was both, you get all ranges and everyone can enjoy it. So, mm-hmm. um, so yeah, no, it's, it's all, it's all good. Awesome. Kind of like the pie, whatever, whatever <laughs> one I'm doing at the moment is my favorite. <laughs> And I think that's what's awesome. Just each new experience or whatever it is you're enjoying, you're passionate about is, is what just does the trick. Yes, for sure. I like the walking, you know, I like it when you can walk the fields and, and watching the dogs work. It's, it's truly a, a like a ballet to watch them. Yeah. So. And in the beautiful scenery that Idaho and Flying Bee Ranch has to offer is probably just amazing experience. Yes. Yes, I can't. I mean, and to see, I've been following them and seeing the, all, how the, all the fields are so green now. It's, it's such a difference from when we were there in February when everything was so brown, mm-hmm. but I'm looking forward. We're doing another one in February. So yeah. um, I'm excited about that. Very cool. All right, Lynn, thank you so much for joining me today and giving the listeners a great learning opportunity here. I know there's going to be a lot of takeaway and value from it. So I really appreciate you sharing your knowledge with us. I hope so. I mean, I know I'm not an expert, but I feel like I've done enough to at least have an opinion on it. Mm -hmm. For sure. All right. Keep cool there, Maryland. I'll try. Thank you so much for having (laughs) me. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Bird Dog Babe podcast. If you enjoyed this episode and learned something from the content, please share it with your friends. Please subscribe, rate, and review this podcast on whichever platform you're listening from. Check out the show notes for links to references from this episode, as well as info on how to connect through Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. If you're loving this podcast and want to support the production and content, please consider becoming one of my Patreon patrons. Being a patron connects us more on a personal level where I'm able to help answer questions and give advice. My husband William and I have bred, owned, and trained AKC Master Hunters, Field Champions, NAVDA VCs, and AKC Show Champions. We're excited to not only share what we've learned, but also listen from previous and future episode guests for additional content. Go to patreon.com backslash thebirddogbabe and $5 per month and you're in. And as always, 2% goes to conservation. Until next week, bird dog babes, keep them versatile.